This lesson deals with connection and device constraints in phaser form. You can find these notes in the course ebook in chapter 4, starting on page 15. Let me first state Kirchhoff's voltage law for phasers. The algebraic vector sum of the voltage phaser rises equals the algebraic vector sum of the voltage phaser drops around any closed path. In other words, if these were the rise in voltages, say V1 through V sub J, it would equal the drops, say K through N. Now why is this true? Well, if we consider the same problem in the time domain, we have the summation of the rises in voltage equals the sum of the drops in voltage. But you could write this as the real part of V1 times e to the j phi1 times e to the j omega t. Likewise for V2, e to the j phi2 times e to the j omega t all the way through j. Then on the right-hand side of the equation, same thing, we would have the real part of V sub k times e to the j phi of k times e to the j omega t all the way through n. Now we showed earlier on page 11 at the bottom that the sum of the real parts equals the real part of the sum. But here we've got the sum of the real parts. We could also do that as the real part of summing up the phasor voltages times the angular velocity on both sides of the equation. Well, if these are equal, then this term here has to equal this term. But what is this? This is our definition of the phasor V1, V2, through V sub J, and that would equal the phasor V sub K through V sub N. Next is the phasor form of Kirchhoff's current law. Let me read it to you. The algebraic vector sum of the current phasors entering a node equals the algebraic vector sum of the current phasors leaving the same node. And why is this true? Well, the proof is identical to the one for Kirchhoff's voltage law, except we're going to replace V by I. Well, let's take a look at the phasor form of Ohm's law. Let's go back to our definition of a resistance in the time domain. I've got a current entering, a resistor R, and there'll be a voltage across it. The voltage is equal to R times the current going through it. Suppose that that current is I sub A times the cosine of omega T plus V. Sort of our default expression for a current phasor. Let's bring the R inside, and we can express the cosine function as the real part of this scalar times E to the J phi times E to the J omega T. The thing that multiplies E to the J omega T is our phasor. In this case, that'd be our voltage phasor. We could define our voltage phasor as R times I sub A times E to the J phi. Or you could write that simply as R times I sub A at angle phi. But this is also our definition of a current phasor. So we could say then that the phasor voltage is equal to R times the phasor current. So this would be our frequency domain version of Ohm's law. You can also write it as a schematic representation with a resistor R, same as it is in the time domain, but now with a phasor voltage and a phasor current. The phase angle of the voltage across the resistance and the current through the resistance are the same. If we were to sketch a phasor diagram with a real axis and an imaginary axis, and we had a value of I, say it has a magnitude of this length and an angle of phi, the voltage would just be multiplying that times a scalar R. It would be longer than that if R was greater than 1. We sometimes refer to this as being in phase. And what that means is that V of T and I of T both have their maximums and minimums at the same instant in time. Let's take a look at an inductance. Suppose we have a current again, I sub A cosine omega T plus V in the time domain. If that flows through an inductance, we'll create a voltage V of T. We saw in our last chapter that V of T is equal to L di dt. Let's take a derivative of this and multiply it by L. So here's L. The derivative of cosine is minus the sine of the same argument. And then take the derivative of what's in parentheses here with respect to time, which is going to be equal to omega plus zero. So here's that term omega. Let's rearrange terms here. So I have a minus omega L I sub A but working with cosine functions and not sine functions, so let's write the sine as the cosine shifted. The same argument, and then we're going to phase shift that minus 90 degrees. I have a hard time remembering whether it's a plus or minus 90. I'll show you a little trick that I use. Let phi equal 0, and let t equal 0. And here's the cosine of minus 90. And we have the cosine of 0. You have the peak at the value of t equals 0, but now we're going to shift that 90 degrees to the right. It's a quarter cycle. You can imagine moving a cosine over a quarter of a cycle, what you've got is a sine wave. Or you could just memorize that. We can write the cosine as the real part, minus omega L, and then we've got I sub A, and then we could write this as E to the J of this whole quantity. Now let's just write this as a product of terms here. So we have E to the J phi, E to the minus J 90, and then E to the J omega T. Now what is this term over here? Well, let's figure it out. E to the j minus 90 is the cosine of minus 90 plus j times the sine of minus 90. The cosine of minus 90 is 0, and the sine of minus 90 is minus 1. So this is minus j. We could replace this by 
a minus j, and that minus will cancel with this, and that's where this comes from. V of t is the real part of j omega l, i sub a times e to the phi t times e to the j omega t. So the thing that multiplies this is our phasor. For an inductance, the value of v is equal to j omega l times our current phasor. Stated it again, the voltage across an inductance is j omega l times i sub a times e to the j phi, and again, you can write that as i sub a at angle phi, and this is just our definition of the current phasor i. The voltage is equal to a new kind of a resistance times i, but j omega l. So it's a complex number. What does the phasor diagram look like? I suppose I have i sub a at angle phi, and then I'm going to multiply that by j omega l. So it has a magnitude of omega l, and j is on the border between the first and second quadrant, so it's just a plus 90 degrees. I add the angles. The voltage is the same angle as the current, plus 90 degrees. This was our phasor for current, magnitude and angle. The voltage would be 90 degrees ahead of it. In electronics and also in circuits, we talk about the angle with respect to the voltage. So in this case, the angle of the current lags behind the voltage by 90 degrees. Let's take a look at capacitance. So let's have a voltage V of t, which would be some V sub a cosine omega t plus v. I put that across a capacitor. A current's going to flow. It's going to be equal to C d V dt. Let's differentiate our voltage and then multiply it by C. We've got C. Derivative of cosine is minus sine. So here's minus and here's the sine of the same argument. We'll have the V sub a here. And then the derivative of what's inside the parentheses with respect to t is just omega. Minus omega times C times V sub a. And then the cosine is the sine shifted by 90 degrees. Cosine omega t plus v, then minus 90 degrees. And you could write this as the real part of e to the j of this entire argument. You could write this as the product of three terms, e to the j phi, e to the minus j 90, and e to the j omega t. And again, on the last page, we showed that this was equal to minus j. And the minuses and the minuses cancel. I get j omega c times v sub a times e to the j phi times e to the j omega t. So the thing that multiplies e to the j omega t is our phasor. So this is going to be our phasor current i. I is equal to j omega c times v sub a times e to the j phi, which you could write as v sub a at angle phi. But this is our definition of the phasor voltage v. And I'm going to just divide by j omega c. v is equal to something times i. This would be our new Ohm's law relationship for a capacitor. The voltage across the capacitance is equal to the current times the expression 1 over j omega c. Now, what would the phasor diagram look like for this? Suppose I have a voltage v sub a at angle phi. I'm going to multiply that back up here by j omega c. The magnitude is omega c, and the angle is just equal to 90 degrees between the first and second quadrant. I'm going to add these two angles when we multiply that. We have 90 plus phi. If I were to sketch the voltage with some length at an angle of phi, the current would have the same angle plus 90 degrees. And then multiply it by this scalar and make the vector longer or shorter. For capacitance, the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees. Let's take the idea of a frequency domain Ohm's law and generalize it. For a resistance, we had V is equal to R times I. Let's define the following. Let's say that V is equal to Z times I, where V is a phasor voltage and I is a phasor current. And we'll call Z impedance. Since this can be anything, it can be a resistor, a capacitor, an inductor, or even a combination of series and parallel combinations, I'm just going to draw this as a rectangular box and label the value of Z. And the units here would have to be ohms. For a resistance, Z is equal to R. For an inductance, it's equal to j omega l, as we've shown previously. And then for a capacitance, it's 1 over j omega c. Now, dealing with reciprocal sometimes can be tedious, and so let's do the following. Let's multiply numerator and denominator by j. So I have j over j squared, but j squared is minus 1. This becomes minus j over omega c. Just an observation, 1 over j is minus j. Now, we also had that i is equal to g times v. So let's say that i is equal to y times v where y is called admittance. We would have units of 1 over ohms, or Mohs, or Siemens. We could use a rectangular box to show the value of y and the unit that goes along with it. Voltage across the element, current going in the plus terminal, coming out the minus terminal. For resistance, y is equal to 1 over r, or just g. For an inductance, it'd be 1 over j omega l. And 1 over j is equal to minus j, so it'd be minus j over omega l. And lastly, for a capacitance, the admittance would be j omega c. And this is connection and device constraints in phasor form.